Welcome to another Friday night. Uh, we've been looking at a more detailed look at the 60 characteristics of complex trauma. And I really hope it's been helping you understand yourself better, understand practical tools for getting healthier. Today we come to one that kind of carries over a little bit from last week, but it's new and needs to be looked at separately. And it's that people from complex trauma need distractions. I often say that one of the worst punishments that you can give a person with complex trauma is to put them in an empty room all by themselves with nothing to do. And they'll go crazy because they need to be distracted by doing something all the time. I want to begin a little differently and, and just look at the cause of this right up front. I think there's multiple things in complex trauma that set a person up to need distractions. But the main thing is, what does a child do when they have mainly negative emotions and they can't resolve them? They can't make them happy emotions. Well, nobody wants to live, well, nobody wants to live with predominantly negative emotions all the time. And so you need to be busy. You need to be distracted doing stuff so that you don't feel. And so one of the main reasons for needing distractions is it's a way of not feeling your emotions. Another way to look at that is what comes out of complex trauma is you feel in danger all the time, so you live with anxiety and fear all the time. And again, it's usually at a subconscious level. You're not even aware of that. And you're on eggshells. You're vigilant. You're always on guard. And as a result of that, you've got cortisol in the brain. And cortisol gives you the extra energy through adrenaline to fight or flight. But once you get cortisol and all that extra energy, you can't sit still. That energy's got to go out. And so what happens in complex trauma is you got cortisol happening all the time. And so sitting still is very hard to do because you got this energy to burn. And so you just have one distraction after another to keep you busy, to give you an outlet for all of that energy. <clears throat> another aspect of complex trauma is shame. The child feels the reason I'm abandoned, abused, neglected is something's wrong with me. And so what happens out of that is I no longer like myself. I no longer want to have a relationship with myself because I, I think I'm a terrible person. And so the last thing I want to do is sit in my own skin. I'm not comfortable there. And so you need distraction so you don't have to live with yourself. You don't have to be comfortable in your own skin. And then there's another important piece. A key part of complex trauma is lack of connection. And so what produces a sense of well-being, stability, security, is being connected to a safe rock, to a safe person who's consistently nurturing, nurturing consistent boundaries. And so that person helps me to regulate my emotions, process my problems. They teach me, they comfort me, they help me. And so I get this feeling of calm and peace because my rock is always there for me. But what happens if a child tries to connect and they can't? All of a sudden their world is very insecure. All of a sudden they're on eggshells, on guard, and they can't sit still. They need distractions to use all of this energy from being on guard all the time. I found it interesting that the word tame, when we use it of animals, is a tame animal is an animal that has developed ties or connection with a human being. A wild animal is one that has no ties. No connection. 
And I think that can be kind of transferred to children. Children who make connections are tame. They're calm. Children who don't make connections are wild. They got all this feral energy that they want to use. And then another reason why we need distractions is that a child who's been neglected, can't connect, feels all alone against the big bad world. They feel like they've been abandoned. And so when you face a big bad world with only your tiny little toolkit, it creates all kinds of anxiety and insecurity, which creates cortisol, which creates energy that has to get used so you need distractions. And that helps you not to feel the anxiety as well. Now, I want to take this in a direction that I have been asked about a lot recently that I hope will be helpful to you, and that is ADHD. And I want to use the work of Dr. Gaber Maté from Canada, who's written a book called Scattered Minds. And it was his first book and it was his research into ADHD. He had been di he was a doctor, diagnosed many children with ADHD, had been diagnosed himself. And his question is, is it genetic or environmental? Is it the result of trauma? Because everybody that he diagnosed with ADHD, he saw a childhood trauma connection. And so he began to challenge kind of the existing psychiatric world's opinion on ADHD, that it was just a genetic thing. And so that's what I want to look at. But let me just start by saying this. Statistics on ADHD, that the average age of a diagnosis of a child with ADHD is age seven. The average age when symptoms started to appear was age three to six. 6.1% of children in Canada and the U.S. are taking medication for ADHD. But about 11% have been diagnosed with ADHD. So that means 11% of children are considered in our culture to have ADHD. That's a lot of kids. 42% increase in ADHD diagnosis over the past eight years. So it's something that's getting diagnosed more frequently, a lot more frequently with each passing year. And then this one, the average cost of ADHD per person is $14,576. The yearly cost to Americans in the States is $42.5 billion for all of the ADHD stuff. So it a, costs a lot of money. So when we talk about ADHD, it's kind of there's three different types. So the first would be the attention deficit part without the hyperactivity part. So the predominantly the issue is attention deficit, paying attention. The second is predominantly the hyperactive part. The attention is not a big issue, but they're very impulsive and hyperactive. And then the third is where you see both attention deficit and hyperactivity in the same child. So those are the three things. So the symptoms so inattentiveness, number one. So again, you can do a test of yourself, of your kids, and you need a lot of these in order to kind of be diagnosed as it. But inattentiveness, so a short attention span and easily distracted, make careless mistakes because they don't pay attention or read carefully the instructions or even the question. And so they make a lot of unnecessary mistakes. They appear very forgetful. They lose things because they just don't concentrate on where they left it. Unable to stick to tasks that are tedious or time-consuming and easily distracted. Appear to be unable to listen to or carry out instructions. 
So you're trying to tell them what to do and they're not really paying attention. Or they have difficulty with multiple instructions. So you say, do this. And then once you're done that, do this. And then, then you need to do this. Well, they can't keep track of that many instructions. Or they get a bunch of tasks they know that they need to do and they can't stick at one. So they do this one, bounce over to this one, bounce over to that one, and they just can't stick at a task. They're constantly changing. Or they got a lot of things they need to do. They just can't get organized to do it. So they have a lot of difficulty getting organized. Some people refer to ADHD, the brains of ADHD people, as a pinball machine. The ball just bounces all over. And so it's you're looking at this, and it's squirrel, squirrel, and you just bounce all over the place. And, and it's very hard to keep track of what the person's thinking or talking about. Another one is they have trouble being present in relationships to their children or to their partner, and they're easily bored. <clears throat> so that's the inattentiveness part. Now the next characteristic is the hyperactivity or and or impulsiveness. So they're just unable to sit still, especially in calm or quiet surroundings. Constantly fidgeting, excessive physical movement, Excessive talking, or they interrupt conversations. They can't wait their turn to speak. They talk over people. They interrupt. They can't wait their turn in line. They want to butt in, or they just don't go there. They act without thinking, impulsive buying, little or no sense of danger. So they don't think through actions to say, what would be the consequences? They just impulsively do stuff without thinking about the risk. And then often anger issues. And so what you can easily see is a child who has ADHD, that would cause significant problems in their life. Many would then underachieve at school because they can't focus properly on schoolwork. Many would have poor social interaction because they butt in, because they talk over people. And then a lot would be considered bad kids because they don't sit still. They seem to have behavior problems. And so what happens for a lot of those people is they're kind of branded as bad. And they, the child then, with that kind of identity, can often become defiant. So ODD, Opposition or Defiance Disorder, can go along with ADHD because they just are so tired of being branded bad or punished for stuff that they just start rebelling. Now, sadly, in the past, when people have seen a child with ADHD, their solution is that child just needs more discipline. They need more rules. They need harsher discipline. That'll fix them. And often, that is not what they need. Now, let me just segue over into talking about ADHD in adults. So it's mainly diagnosed in children, but it can be diagnosed in adults. So here's where you can do a self-evaluation. Again, if you have only one or two of these characteristics, it doesn't mean you have ADHD. So number one, lack of focus. Easily distracted today. Find it hard to follow a conversation and listen because you just it's too hard to concentrate. You overlook details because you didn't pay enough attention. Or you start a lot of tasks, but you don't complete them. Or you can go to not just lack of focus. Some are hyper-focused. They get a, a project and they are obsessed. That's all they can think about. That's all they do. Another one is disorganization. Have trouble getting organized. Forgetfulness. So much stuff going on in their brain that they forget stuff. And that leads to time management problems. They procrastinate. 
They're regularly late for events. They go to events and they're just bored because they're disinterested in the topic. They're only interested in things that interest them. And then impulsiveness. Acting without thinking about consequences. Interrupting conversations. Being socially inappropriate. Rushing through tasks. Impulsive buying. And then you develop this negative self-image. A shame identity. Another characteristic, <clears throat> trouble managing your emotions. So mood swings, anger issues, anxiety, depression issues, easily bored. And when you're bored, you just want to push buttons. Lack of motivation can be part of that feeling bored. Restlessness, fatigue. And you can see relationship problems because of all of that. So those are characteristics of what would be ADHD in adults. Now, let me look at this question. How does ADHD come to be? And I want to go with Dr. Gaber Maté and look at it from an environmental thing. Now, I'm not saying that every case has to fit this, that it's not possible that there might be some gen genetic factors. But I think more and more, as people understand complex trauma, more and more they're understanding how it contributes to ADHD. ADHD is a natural outcome in a child who is in a dangerous environment. So... If you look at it very medically and do brain scans, what you find is that ADHD is, is connected to a lack of dopamine in a child, in the brain. And so dopamine is what helps us focus on things. It's what gives us motivation, and it helps us keep our, it keeps our attention on, on things. So lack of dopamine, I'm going to come back to that. If you look at it from the complex trauma world, ADHD can be seen as a type of dissociation. So a child is sitting in school, but they're worrying about what's going to happen at home tonight. They have trouble staying focused. Or when they're in a dangerous situation at home, they can't fix it. They can't reconcile it. So what the brain does to protect them is they tune out. And that is their ADHD. They just, they don't focus. They tune out. They're off somewhere else. And so it comes out of trauma in several ways. Now let me take this further. I want you to think about human brain development. What the research is showing is that our brain's development is largely based on our environment, okay? So think of this. The human brain, when a baby is born, is very undeveloped. You look at any other mammal, and when a horse is born, a cow is born, that brain is developed to the point where it is up and walking within 15 minutes, with the human brain, that, that takes up to a year for the child to be able to walk. So the brain is very underdeveloped in the human. And so when they come into the world, that brain needs the right environment to continue to develop in a healthy way. And what we're finding is the environment that the brain needs to develop well is a non-stressed person caring for them, a person who is emotionally available and connected, and a caregiver who is consistent. That is the environment the brain needs. So another way to say that is human brain development, if it's to be done in a healthy way, is dependent on a nurturing relationship with a caregiver, which means it needs a parent who is a, in a good emotional state, who is regulating their emotions properly, 
who is resolving painful emotions properly. That is what a child needs for their brain to develop. Now, what happens if they don't have that? Then you have an environment where there's stress. And it is important to understand that when a child is born, it has no capacity to regulate themselves under stress. And so they depend totally on their parents to regulate, the parents to regulate themselves, their parents to manage the situation, and their parents to help the child regulate their own emotions. All of that is necessary. But if the parent is stressed out because of their problems and they're not able to regulate it and resolve it, they pass their stress on to their children without meaning to. And so now the child has all of this extra stress. Okay, now understand that from two perspectives. In experiments done with monkeys, they took monkeys away from their mother, which created huge stress in the monkeys. Then they did imaging, imaging of the brain. And what they found out was that the dopamine release in the brain was normal in the stressful conditions in all parts of the brain except one, the front part, the cortex, the part that controls impulses. And so now the baby monkeys, they had all the right dopamine everywhere else except the cortex, and they couldn't control their brain, couldn't control their impulses. The second thing is in the stress environment is cortisol and adrenaline are being released. And so that is creating extra vigilance, extra on guard, ready for fight or flight. Next thing I think is so important to understand is this. Children are these amazing sensory machines. Now, if you're a parent, you may have gone to parenting courses, and often what used to happen in parenting courses, they told you, develop this routine for your kids. Do these activities with your kids. And, and so parenting was kind of assessed as being good if you had the, a good routine and the right activities. But what we're finding out is there's something that even impacts your children more than doing the right activities with them in the right routine. It's your children pick up your emotional state. So if you're stressed, they're stressed. They pick up if you're angry, if you have irritability. They pick up your anxiety, your fears. A child senses all of that. You don't have to do anything. And then they also pick up your values, your attitudes. If you have resentments, if you're prejudiced, they pick up all of those things. And so what happens in complex trauma? You have parents who are stressed, angry, full of fear, parents who have depression issues, parents who have tension in the, the relationship and conflict. You have a family that's not connecting consistently. All of that, the child is picking up stress, stress, stress. is creating tremendous anxiety in the child. What then happens inside the child? They don't have the tools to resolve that. And so ADHD comes out. They can't focus because there's just so much danger. There's so much anxiety happen. And now they need distractions in order to not to feel all that anxiety. And so ADHD becomes a logical response of a brain that is living in constant anxiety. And that is why I think there's so much merit in the work that Dr. Gabor Maté's done in this area. It meshes so well with what we know about complex trauma. So when it comes then to healing, I think there is a place for medication with ADHD. 
There is a place. But what I encourage parents and, and people to see is don't see that as the only part of the solution. Don't put all your eggs in that basket. Start working on therapy. Get to safe places. Start having the tools to resolve problems and deal with your stress. Because as you do that, that in and of itself should help reduce some of the ADHD type things. So if you are in a relationship that is not safe, you're going to have some ADHD issues. If you're in an environment that is not safe, you are going to have some ADHD issues because you're on guard. So you need to get yourself in with safe people and safe environment. That is so necessary. When it comes to your children, understand that if ADHD in them is due to you and your creating an environment where the child doesn't feel safe, that the change for them means it has to start with a change in you. You need to be a consistent rock. You need to set consistent, loving boundaries that you enforce consistently. You need to connect with your child. You need to be present to your child. You need to have your emotions regulated. You need to be watching and working on your attitudes, your emotional world, because your child has this radar system that is picking up on all of that. And so as you grow to be healthier, it helps your child relax. Your child begins to feel safe. So... Work on yourself. That will help your children. Let me take it a wee bit further. Become comfortable in your own skin. That means you work on your shame. That means you start connecting with yourself, your emotions. You spend time exploring your emotions, who you are. Learn to regulate your emotions. Learn to manage your emotions how you express emotions so that you grow and become healthier in those things. All of that will help you with your ADH tendencies, and it will help your children as well with theirs. So, needing distractions, such a common issue for, so, for just about everybody that I work with. I hope you see that as you connect with yourself, you learn to like yourself, become your own best friend, that it is a place of peace. Constant distractions is a place of restlessness, discontent. It is no way to live. And so you have to begin to learn to catch when you're back into needing a distraction Stop yourself and say, why am I needing to distract myself right now? What's going on inside? And you spend some time taking an inventory and you go, oh, yeah, I got some anxiety. I got some stress. I got some depression. Uh, I'm feeling a little out of sorts. Okay, what do I need to do to get that resolved? So I need to get connected to somebody else emotionally, to my higher power spiritually. I need to resolve some of this stresses in my life. I need to do some self-care. So you learn to catch when you're sliding into needing distractions. Find out what's underneath. Why is my brain going to distractions? Well, usually it's because I don't want to feel. Okay, what is it I don't want to feel? Let's fix that. And let's learn to enjoy relationships and connection because that is a deeper joy and peace than distractions. Well, that's the end of part one. Again, hope that is so helpful to you. We're going to take a short break. Then I'm going to come back for part two, which is the Christian part. 
If you're not interested in that, that's fine. You're free to go. We'll see you next week. To everybody else, I'll be back in a minute. Well, welcome back. We've been looking at Peter, his life, one of the followers of Jesus, and finding that this guy has a lot of characteristics of a person with complex trauma, and I hope it's been helping you learn. Tonight we come to the time in the life of Jesus just before he was crucified. So he celebrated the Passover with his disciples, then he goes to his trial, and last time we looked at Peter denying that he even knew Jesus, failure after failure. But I want to look at what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. So again, Matthew 26 says, Then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and he said, Sit here while I go over there to pray. <clears throat> he took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Now, if you stop and think about that, Jesus is saying, I am feeling a depression, a crushing grief, pain that is making me feel it might kill me. That is how intense the pain was. And so he says this to his disciples. He says, I'm hurting. I am struggling big time, greater than I've ever struggled in my life. Please sit here and keep watch with me. I could use your support right now. And then it says he went a little further and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me He's saying, God, it's too great. It's killing me. Uh, please take it away. But, but bottom line, I want your will to be done, not mine. So even if you still want me to go through it, I will. But my, my natural inclination is I don't want to go through it. We're told in Luke's gospel that Jesus sweat drops of blood. And we know that in ex cases of extreme, extreme stress, the body can secrete blood. That's how great the stress can be. So this is Jesus experiencing a level of stress greater than most of us have ever experienced. And so he prays that, and he goes back to Peter, James, and John, and he'd ask them to, be, to sit and watch and support him, and what does he find? They are asleep. And he says to Peter, couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. So I want to just give you a couple lessons from this story. I think it's so helpful that Jesus acknowledged to Peter, the spirit is willing the flesh is weak. In other words, there are going to be times in our life when we want to do the right thing, but something gets in the way and keeps us from doing it. And it's called the flesh. And so I would conclude is that the flesh means our physical body and our mistrained limbic brain. And so often we have great intentions, but they don't happen because either we're just too tired worn out, or our limbic brain is in instant gratification focus. And so that just trips us up all the time, 
and, and we don't follow through on our good intentions. So another way to say that is Jesus is saying, Peter, I know you've got great intentions. I, I honor that. But you need to recognize there's other forces inside of you that are very powerful. And at times they will get in the way of your good intentions. So Jesus is giving a rebuke, but it's a mild rebuke. He's not coming down on hard on Peter and saying, you are a failure. You're a terrible person. You couldn't even watch with me one hour. What kind of friend are you? He knows that the last few days of the disciples' life and his life have been exhausting. They have been going constantly. Not a lot of sleep. Lots of stress. Lots of pressures. And so he gets it. They're tired. And he acknowledges, yes, there are times when our own bodies and brains are going to fail us. But then I thought about what would this have been like for Peter a couple years later to look back on? I think Peter would have been full of feelings of regret. Here, his friend, his best friend, was going through the most difficult time of his life, a time of overwhelming depression and pain. Peter could have been there for him, but he wasn't. Peter was so wrapped up in whether he was going to be the greatest that he wasn't even tuned into the pain that his best friend was going through. And I think he would have seen his self-centeredness he would have seen his lack of being there for his friend, and that would have filled him with a lot of regrets. And it would have been a very humbling thing. And we have those kind of failures, sadly, in being the kind of friends that our friends need us to be. But I think there's a third lesson, and this is the one that hits me the hardest. I think of what Jesus was going through. He was about to be tortured. He was about to die. He was about to be separated from his father. And he had never once been separated from his father. They had had a perfect intimacy. Just what he was going to go through was so overwhelming, he sweat drops of blood. So I asked myself, what do I tend to do when I am super stressed out? Well, usually the, the more stressed out I am, the less I'm inclined to love other people. The more I'm inclined to become narcissistic. I want to make it all about me, my problems, getting what I want. And so here is Jesus at a level of stress none of us has experienced. And what's his response? Well, he sees these disciples fighting. He sees disciples that need to get their feet washed, and Peter, who's in the servant's position, doesn't wash their feet. He sees disciples denying him, fleeing from him, all of the stuff that they're doing. What would we have done to what was like bratty, immature little children? We probably would have lost it on them. We probably would have said, I am fed up with you guys, and we would have tore into them. And what do we find with Jesus? In this place of incredible pain, he still loved. He was patient with them. He taught them patiently. He forgave them. He modeled for them how they should act. Do you realize that that's where you see the truest love is when it comes from a place of stress and pain. When a person still chooses to care about others when their own needs are filling up the radar screen, that's when you find true love, the deepest love. Because your limbic brain is saying, I don't want to love. I want my needs to be all important. But when a person in that place of intense limbic brain 
can move to his cortex and say, I still choose to love and meet the needs of those I am responsible for, that is amazing love. And I think Peter looked back on this occasion many, many times in his life, and he just thought, wow. Oh, how he loved me. What amazing love. I want to love that way as well. And I hope that's our heart's desire too. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this amazing example of Jesus. To love from a place of pain. We don't do that very well. And I just pray that you would encourage us and help us, motivate us to be that kind of loving person to those in our lives. Amen. Well, that's another Friday night. Thank you so much for being with us. I look forward to seeing you again next week. Have a great weekend.